السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله In our lessons on Imam Ghazali's book of Halal and Haram we spent a, uh, quite a bit of time going around this topic as well before we looked at the book we touched upon some of the importance of this the section before looking at the section on halal and haram we have looked at before looking at the section on caution which we're looking at today we looked at some of the key guidance related to actualizing caution in our day-to-day -day lives right last week and that's very important because one of the most important reasons why we study right with teachers is to contextualize the content of guidance into the living reality that we're that we are in right um reliably according to what the living scholars state right so it's not just context without the context of guidance with not just context without the content of guidance let's just talk about it but it's also not just disembodied guidance without consideration of context right and that is the duty of you know the, the teachers and that's why we you know we, we relate this from our teachers right the, what do our teachers who took from their teachers say in these times that we are in how do we apply this right because some of the things, if you act upon them literally, you can do more harm than good in your life and in the life of others, right? Because what applies in a particular context may not apply in another. And what applies in a particular context may not apply in another. So that is something to keep in mind. Now, today, bi ta'ala, we begin the section on caution in our dealing with matters of halal and haram caution in our dealing with issues of the halal and haram and the levels of caution so we looked previously at practical caution last lesson right practical caution levels of caution it's also important to know what is your obligation in life it's straightforward. Stick to the halal, avoid the haram. There's things that are clearly halal, avoid them, uh, do them. Things that are clearly haram, avoid them completely. That's it. Now, if you want to go beyond that and have caution, right? Have caution. How do you exercise caution? Right? That is what we're going to look at. And realize that being careful in general what is the religious ruling of being careful right caution what is the ruling of being cautious it's recommended what is obligatory is to do the is to avoid the haram right that's obligatory right when in in matters of the day to day you don't have to eat something halal Right? Because you can eat something else, right? So you know, so you're not sure whether thing X is halal, you can eat something else halal. But when so there's nothing permissible that is ob obligatory in specifically for you to do. The challenge is avoid the haram. That's the, the key challenge. But beyond that, caution is recommended. Right? Caution is recommended. You're in a Muslim country, for example. Unless you know otherwise, can you assume that the butcher's meat is halal? Yes. Unless the people of knowledge, unless the reliable people of knowledge tell you otherwise. And sadly, there's some Muslim countries where they import from random places, etc. But that's just someone being religious tells you to be careful does not mean anything particularly if it's transmitted through 
WhatsApp or, or the like. That's not basis of anything, right? So your duty just to stick to the obviously halal, right? Caution going above and beyond that is recommended, not obligatory. Right? It's recommended, not sp strictly speaking obligatory. And you need to just be aware of that so that you don't overwhelm yourself because don't try to do everything religious all at once. I don't try to do everything religious all at once. So Imam al-Ghazali tells us about there being three levels of caution. right? But the first element of caution to understand is in general, caution is recommended. In general, caution is recommended. Then there is what Imam al-Ghazali calls the caution of the upright. What is the caution of the upright? They carefully avoid what is clearly haram. What is agreed upon to be haram. Right? So for example, pepperoni. What is it? What's pepperoni normally from? What's pepperoni normally from? It's not a trick question. Yeah, from pork. Right? It's made from pork. And made from pig. So, this being a basically upright Muslim, you need to avoid the clearly haram. Unless, you, you, you know, it's pepperoni from a halal pizza place or whatever. Right? The caution of the, the upright is that you avoid what is clearly haram. Right? That's, and that's basic taqwa. That's basic taqwa. That you avoid... The caution of the upright, right? Like of a basically practicing Muslim is you avoid what is clearly haram. So, for example, if we just simple example first, um, we start with food, right? Like as as we did, it says pepperoni on it. You don't know. Yeah. You don't know if it's a Muslim store, right? So, unless they said it's halal, you'd find out that, okay, that's, if you don't, that's a sign you're not an upright person, right? You go to a place that's selling, um, that's selling some traditionally Muslim dish, but th there's no sign that says it is halal. Can you just eat meat just because, like, does something being, for example, if someone's selling biryani, like there's lamb biryani, but there's no sign that it's halal. Just because it's biryani, does it make it halal? No, because non-Muslims eat biryani too. So the basic thing is that you make sure that you just confirm the halal. That is the basic caution of the upright, that you just confirm that something is halal. And in that, this is easy. Why? Because at the level of obligation, you can take people's words for it. You can take people's words for it. Right? You can take people's word for it. Even non-Muslims, right? If a non-Muslim says, this is halal, right? Basically, you can take their word for it. Right? At the level of basic caution, right? You can take their word for it. You just confirm this is halal and it's not haram. And anything that is whose starting ruling is that it's not allowed, you would check. For example, in the case of men, are men allowed to wear silk? No, right? So let's say there's a silk shirt. Can you just make an assumption? Oh, maybe this shirt is synthetic silk. Can you accept that? No. Because silk is not allowed for men to, you know, to wear. So you heard from some random uncle that, beta, you know, silk, real silk is expensive, but... 
most silk is synthetic. Actually, you know, if you just check it, that's not true. Most silk is not synthetic. If it says silk, actually, we have something called, you know, there's, you know, the, there's laws related to things like that. If it says it's silk, means it's silk, right? So something that's not haram, not halal, you have to confirm, right? That otherwise it's not allowed for you to wear silk, for example, right? For, for a man or a similar thing that's not allowed for men or women, right? For example, what's something that women aren't allowed to wear? Right? Now, depending on the madhab, certainly in the Hanafi school, for example, it's not permitted for women to wear rings that are not from gold and silver. So you find out. And that's the matter of khilaf. That's a separate matter. But if, this, if that's all you know, then you don't know that any other kind of ring is permitted in some schools. At a level of basic caution, you would find out. It says, you know. Um, so that's the basic, that's the basic caution of the upright, right? That you avoid the haram. But there's an easy caution. Right? The, what's the easy caution of the upright? Relates to food, it relates to drink, relates to what you wear. But there's also the caution of the upright that relates to the rights of others. Which is what? It's obligatory for you to fulfill their right. And it's haram for you not to fulfill their right. So let's say you have, you know, you know, Zubair was having trouble paying his bills. Of course, be careful about these things, but Zubair had trouble paying his bills. So what did he, did he do? He borrowed money from Zubaydah. Payable. You know, actually, he purchased something from Zubaydah. His coffee machine broke. Zubaydah said, look, I've given up on coffee. I'll sell you my coffee machine. So she sold her coffee machine for hundred dollars payable at the end of the, on the 30th of the month now the 30th of the month comes and Zubair likes a nice weighing scale people spend ridiculous amounts on coffee gadgets 250 dollar weighing scale second hand for 100 bucks so instead of paying Zubaydah on time he buys the weighing scale a basic caution of the upright, and this is basic caution, this is obligatory caution, is you, it is obligatory to fulfill the rights, the material rights of others, such as paying your bills on time. Right? And very often people are very careful about, oh, you know, someone says it's halal. Then you ask them, it's hand slaughtered. Where is it hand slaughtered from? Show me your bills. Show me this month's bill. Show me the, you know, like they go nitty gritty on something like that, which is, we'll come to that. But when it comes to the halal and haram with respect to the rights of others, they're not careful, right? The material rights of others. And we're just talking the basic material rights of others. If you owe something, you give it back on time. You repay your debt on time. From the caution of the upright, the basic caution is if you make a contract, it is obligatory to, for you to fulfill it. In the event of being unable to fulfill a contract, what is your obligation? Is to clarify and reframe, right? I'm working for Hamza's clean, uh, Neat Gardens. It's called Hang, Hamza's Amazing Neat Gardens. If I said, I'll work 30 hours a week. And let's say he needs help on weekends, right? So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, he needs help. I keep telling him, I tell, I, I won't be available. So sorry, this Sunday, I can't work. This Saturday, next Saturday, I can't work. And I don't fulfill my hours. But I still expect full payment. That's haram. That's haram. Unless 
you know, exceptions happen, but if it becomes a norm, it's a sin. So there you have to clarify that. I, I apologize. I'm not able to work full time for you. We can reframe that. Right? So that is the caution of the upright. That stick to the limits of Allah. Don't go fancy. First level is caution of the upright is related to not only our food, our drink, our dress, but also related to the rights of others. And it relates to the material rights of others, what you owe people, etc. But also relates to the non-material rights of others. What are the non-material rights of others? Yeah. The non-material rights of others is that you do not wrong them. For example, by lying to, by backbiting slander tail bearing right backbiting slander tail bearing by lying to them cheating them or deceiving them right these are six non-material rights of others right in general that you don't Backbite. And backbiting is very simple. It's to mention something about another that they would dislike. And backbiting is when it's true. Even to them. You, you tell Zubair, Zubair, you put on some weight. Would most people like that? No. That's backbiting. It's only called backbiting because a dignified person would have enough self-respect not to say it to someone that, in, in, you know, to their face. But even in the English language, actually across religious traditions as well, if you look in the Summa Theologica of uh, Thomas Aquinas, he discusses it out too, but Islamically it's very clear. Even if you say it to their face, it's disliked. Unless you have the intention of nasiha, right? You know, your, your friend has developed a habit of having, you know, the fourth, they have the thing, the fourth slice of cake is the best. Now he's ha having trouble breathing. So there, that's not backbiting. Say, so, oh, mashallah, you're put, you put on a lot of weight. That's backbiting, even if you say it to them. Mentioning another by what they dislike. Right? That relates to the rights of, of others. If you say it to a third party, that's, that's bad. But if you, what you say is untrue, it's tail-bearing, which is worse. But which, that's... Um, that, that's slander, tail-bearing, disclosing secrets. And anything said in a private gathering, you have to assume it's secret. Unless there's clear permission to say it. Right? Some people say, I know I'm not I'm probably not supposed to tell you, but uh, Zubaydah is pregnant. Right? That is, so you have no share of basic caution. right? And likewise, from the non-material rights are the rights of parents, rights of family, right? There's obligatory rights of parents and family. And then there's recommended rights, right? So that's from the caution of just a, of basic uprightness, of just being an upright believer. Just being a basic upright believer. Beyond that, you have the caution of the righteous, right? You have the caution of the righteous, of the salihin, right? The caution of the righteous relates to each of these above by avoiding the disliked, right? By avoiding the disliked and by being careful regarding, by being careful regarding indirectly falling into the haram on the basis of knowledge, right? How? Is it haram to stay up late? No, right? But if you're staying up late could result in your missing fajr, then that permitted act, which in itself is allowed, if it could result in you falling into 
something not allowed, which is not praying on time, would be disliked. So you avoid the disliked. Either that which is in itself disliked or something that could lead to the haram. You know, often when you discuss politics, you get into arguments with your dad. Is it obligatory for you to discuss politics? No, right? Now, if it always leads you to, to, to get into an argument, then it would be haram for you to discuss politics, right? But from the caution, the righteous is to avoid that which could reasonably lead to the haram. Whether with matters of prayer, matters of relationships, especially the most sensitive, Likewise, right? Likewise, with respect to your caution, with respect to the material rights of another, right? That, you know, Zubay has not really checked his bank account. So he sees that excellent, that amazing deal on the fancy weighing scale for the coffee synchronizes with his phone, etc. Why you need to do that, that's a separate thing. But he doesn't consider that what are the bills I have to pay? What are the debts that are payable? Right? So what he does? Unthinking spending leading to non-fulfillment of rights. He did not consciously not fulfill the right, but when it's indirect, it was disliked. Because what would the righteous person do? The righteous person is careful to do the right thing. Careful to do the right thing. So before they spend, they check that can I, do I have enough to fulfill my financial obligations first and then the spending. That's from the caution of the righteous. From the caution of the righteous is also to avoid the things in which there is dislikedness or difference of opinion. But on the basis of knowledge, Right? On the basis of knowledge, meaning not just because of random tweets. Someone said, guess what, guys? Um, all milk in Canada is haram. Ever heard that? And I've seen, I don't, uh, you know, I don't stay on WhatsApp groups. Um, but you know, people spread wacky things like that. Right? So if you get something like that, you ignore it. Right? But we're talking about actual difference of opinion. Within mainstream Islamic scholarship, there's difference of opinion. It's good to avoid it. But this caution is recommended. right? And you have to be most careful about the things that are directly related to the halal and haram. right? But this is from the caution of the righteous. Higher than this is the caution of the truly mindful. And the caution of the truly mindful of the muttaqeen, right? And these are not just basic taqwa, but someone who's upholding taqwa in their life, right? They'll be called a muttaqi, a God-fearing servant of Allah. A God-fearing servant of Allah avoids things that are not harmful. So they're not disliked in order to not to have the possibility of falling in the haram. Right? And it's related from the Sahaba that we used to leave much of the halal out of caution of falling into the haram. But when does that apply? That applies when there is some religious reason to avoid it. When there's some religious reason to avoid it. The examples are many. But for example, you know, there's some new people. You don't know who they are. They say, let's go to a restaurant. That's a basic question to ask. Where are we going? Right? 
Why? Because life experience would say, if you're not careful, you could end up in weird places without having thought it through. In itself, is it allowed to go to a restaurant with some, Muslim, some with any kind of people? Yes. But suddenly, you end up in front of a shisha lounge. And you're not going to go there. Right? But the God-fearing person would find, ask before, especially when there's reason to ask. Right? You know these people. They're religious, upright, etc. But you don't know them. Where are we going? Right? And that's from the caution of the upright. And the key to this caution is that you consider outcomes before you do things. You consider outcomes before you do things. One of the situations I'd find myself in when I used to travel a lot about a decade ago is that oftentimes the, you know, the host organization say, we'll book your hotel for you. Anything wrong with just letting them book your hotel for you? No. But what would end up happening, especially with student groups, they'd put you, especially in the UK, they would put me up in the shadiest of places. Okay. Okay. Once I could even practically from worldly perspective, couldn't go to sleep because my room was right above the nightclub on a Friday night. But there's all kinds of, like, it was like haram fest at that hotel. And not only the nightclub, but literally my room was shaking. Right? I had noise cancelling headphones, no use. Right? I'm not doing anything haram, but you keep away from those things. You learn lessons from these kinds of things. Right? Right? So you avoid... So you exercise, pursue the permissible with consideration of consequence. That's from the... right, And one of the ways you do that is it's a neglected sunnah to consult before you... Consult the experience before you do something. Why? Because they have life experience. They've, they've done those things. You know, you're going to start traveling a lot. You consult the, the religious, the righteous, the learned who have similar experience... How do we handle these kinds of situations? And sometimes you know, they, they'll give you advice, right? That's good for your akhirah, but also sometimes good for the dunya. Right? So that's from the caution of the mindful. Right? And Caution with respect to the rights of others is what? Is also materially that you're careful, like right? careful that you will be able to fulfill their rights. So if you work, let's say you work somewhere, that your work is only Monday to Friday. You have to fulfill 40 hours. So in advance, you see, okay, you, you keep track of your hours so that you make sure by the end of the week you've done your hours. If you've committed to deliver a project on time, you made a commitment. I will you know, design this website for you by this time. So you don't wait till the last day and say, oh my goodness, I couldn't fill the deadline. Basic caution as a righteous servant is what? Is that you make sure in advance that you'll be able to fulfill the rights. You set with material rights, you set the money aside in advance. Right? So you take the means. You don't have to. All... You'll just, at the end of the day, you just have to make sure day off that you pay. But in advance, like you're careful of fulfilling rights. And part of the way to do that is don't overdo the concern for useless things. Right? Useless things. That, okay, I'm going to order from every place on my delivery service. But then tie myself in a knot. I put the order, and then you say, oh my goodness, is it halal? It says it's halal. If you want it to be cautious, find out before. If you want to be cautious, cook your own food. If you want to be cautious, you don't know who are, what are food sources that are not only um, permissi permissible, but also tayyib, wholesome. 
and we talked about this, like there's a way to exercise caution, right? Then we look at a higher level of taqwa, but we can see a few examples of caution from the early Muslims, right? Amongst them, Imam al-Ghazali mentions, right, that right, that some musk, right, some musk was sent to him from Bahrain, which is far from Medina, right? Right? So, he said, but what was his role? He was the commander of the believers. So he said, I wish someone could weigh it for me, they could weigh the must for me, so I could distribute it amongst the Muslims. Right? So one woman said, I can weigh it for you. He didn't answer her. She repeated it. He didn't answer her. Right? 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 Until he found the right person to weigh it. And he had it weighed. Why? So there's several aspects of caution. Firstly, he was careful that he got the, he got the gift. Why? Because he's commander of the believers. But he's responsible for all the Muslims. Right? He didn't get it as an individual. So he didn't want to keep the mosque himself. Said he wanted to distribute it amongst the Muslims. And presumably it was a lot. Right? Number two, he wanted to be careful in weighing it. So he wanted a person who knew how to weigh, to weigh the musk. And musk is tricky because it's thick and so on. So it could be weighed properly. So that everyone got a fair share. Did he have to do all of that? No. He didn't owe them that. But that was the, that was the, the cautious, right? Um, and because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasized giving due measure, right? Giving due measure. Right? Some of the early Muslims, what they would do is when if you know if they weighed, if they weighed things and they put them in a bag, on the other side of the scale, they put an empty bag. So that the weight of the bag, you know, they would give you know, so you're giving, for example, grain. Right? So they want this, you know, let's say modern terms, if we say five kilos of. Lentils, right? But you're putting the lentils in a bag. So they put an empty bag on the other side, so they give the weight of the bag as well to the other person. Even though the weight, the bag has almost no weight. Why? To make sure you give full measure. So you, you take that extra caution, right? But if you're selling something by weight, you take that extra care. And one of the ways to be of the righteous is you give a little extra. Just to make sure you don't fall short. A lot of people, you know, let's say if someone runs a restaurant, right? You say this is a quarter pound burger. So yeah, it's basically looks like a quarter pound. No, even though you could argue that a quarter pounder is not necessarily, you're not making a legal contract that it's exactly a quarter pounds, right? Have you ever measured a burger that you've purchased that's a quarter pound? See, Hamza, have you? Do you expect it to be exactly a quarter pound? No. But if you've stated that it's a quarter pound, just take the extra step, you measure it. Right? So that you don't fall short. You don't fall short. Right? If you're a tutor, right, and you are charging for, for an hour, now the class is finished. The student doesn't have questions. Is a student asking you, let's finish the hour? No. But there's still 12 minutes left. And they're not asking you for a refund. In terms of obligation, have you done your duty? Yes. But you can say, well, we have 12 minutes left. Why don't we read a little more? Why? So that you deliver what you've committed to fully. Right? Likewise, with public rights, 
the, the scholars would be very, very careful. Right? So one of the, the you know, one of the great scholars of Pakistan, when he'd go to work at the madrasa, he's the head off. And because a lot of people in his country would be quite lax with respect to public rights and so on, everything goes. If a, a, a religious question came to him through the madrasa, addressed to the madrasa or to the Dar al Ifta, the Fatwa Council, which he was the head of, he would use the stationery and the pen of the madrasa. But he would very pointedly keep a pen and his own paper, right, with his personal letterhead. So he would not use the madrasa's pen or paper for correspondence sent to the madrasa, but in his name. Why? Because this is not technically work related to the madrasa. Right? right? I've dealt with scholars who, while they're working, uh, while they're working at a particular, you know, whatever institution they're working, you cannot reach them during their work hours by text message, by anything. Why? These are my work hours. Now, you don't have to do that. Normally, do people at any type of work take text messages, even phone calls during work hours? Most people kind of do, right? And people actually kind of factor in a certain degree of distraction, especially in our times, right? Like, have you ever commented to anyone recently if they did one like during their work hours, a friend, that, hey, aren't you at work? No, because you kind of expect, and employers expect a certain degree of distractedness. That was not a case 15 years ago, right? But to be careful, not, even things that people would just let, they wouldn't comment on, to be careful, to do what's expected of you fully, right? Even other things, right? There's one of the scholars from Syria. We had asked him two months ago whether he'd be able to go to the U.S. on behalf of Seeker's Guidance. And he said, yes, I can. Inshallah. He's got Turkish citizenship. So he gave his word. Now, it turns out we don't right now because we've got lots of things going on. We're not going to do that tour with him in September. So we didn't follow up with him. He's contacted twice. That, you know, I, I made a commitment to, to go. Right? Now, he made, a, he made a commitment that he gave his word. I'll, I'll go to England you know, with you guys. Now, does he have to follow up with us? No. But that's from the caution of the righteous, right? That is an example of practical caution. The Sheikh Khalid has followed up twice. That, okay, I made that commitment. Am I needed? I'm, I'm willing to go. And that's why? Because... Your word matters. Not just your commitment, but your word. Then there is a fourth level of caution. Right? And this Imam Al-Ghazali refers to as the caution of the, of the foremost of the true, the Siddiqun. Right? Which is Avoiding things that, and the, these are the highest of the believers, right? The Siddiqun. These are the people on the footsteps of Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, right? They don't just have Siddiq. They're not just true to their commitment to Allah and their commitment to people. But they go above and beyond that. So they don't only have, they don't only avoid the haram or the disliked. They're not only careful about doing anything that could lead to the haram or the disliked, but they go beyond that, that they avoid anything that they're not doing for purely for the sake of Allah. So they're careful not only about their actions, but also about the purity of their intentions. Right? How? For example, a friend of yours said, just come over. Why don't you come over? We'll have tea. To be. Why would most people just show up? 
Why would you just go to, to visit your friend? But they said, come over for tea. So why would you show up? Because they said, come over for tea. Sure, it's my friend or whoever. But uh, is there anything disliked about tea? Not in itself. Although if you're careful about ethical tea, if you look at tea for in much of the world, it's grown. Why is tea so cheap? Because... You know, there's like things resembling slave labor in many countries where tea is grown. Why is most commercially available tea, which is, you know, um, if, especially if it's not really fr fair trade, etc. Just like you know, most chocolate ethically has the blood of the people working in the cocoa pound, uh, plantation stuff. It's essentially slave labor. That's a separate point. That's a different type of caution. But something purely permissible. Come over for tea. But you don't do anything without doing it purely for the sake of Allah. Caution with respect to work is not only that you fulfill your, your contract. You're careful of fulfilling your contract. That you do a little more. But that you do it purely for the sake of Allah. Right? In anything, whether in your acts of worship, your charity, but family ties, why do you go? Well, let's go visit Auntie Zubaydah. She makes the best biryani. Don't go for the biryani, go for Allah. And eat the biryani for Allah too, with restraint. Right? 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 And that's why this caution, however, needs to be learned by people who embody it, right? That's one of the elements of caution, that you have to see how people embody it, and one of the keys is to be gradual, is to be gradual. Don't try to do everything all at once. Right? Don't try to do everything all at once. Now, another of the elements, right, is that not all unclear matters are the same, right? So Imam you know, what we can see from the Imam al-Ghazali that basically there are levels of the unclear. Firstly, you have some unclear matters that are clearly halal and haram. Right? Now, there's no basic caution related to them. Something is clearly haram. Do you have to check if the water is halal? No. Right? Do you have to check if the toothpick is halal? Right? So they're trying to exercise caution about the clearly halal or the clearly haram. You know, you just, you know, checking there is folly. But then if you don't know the ruling of something, caution is called for, which is find out, right? Find out. But their caution isn't, oh, just in case I'm going to avoid it. Because a lot of people make their life miserable. For example, work. Someone got offered work to do something. So I don't know, so therefore I'll avoid it. No, if you don't know, find out. Then if knowledge tells you, right? So there's an initial avoiding because you don't know the ruling. But just avoiding it fully could be haram. How? Let's say that Zubair is unemployed. And he'd promised that not only would he support Zubaydah, but he would pay for her education. Now Zubaydah is getting fed up. Because now she's having to support him for six months. He can't find work. It's obligatory for him to provide. But he's not accepting work because every time some work comes, he finds some technical problem with it. So caution isn't to avoid what you don't know is allowed or not. Caution is that when you don't know, what do you do? You find out, right? So for example, in a very real case, there's a brother who studied overseas, came back to the West, and for nearly a year, he didn't find proper work. Then he started a construction company because he'd done that work before. Didn't find any work. So, and his marriage is teetering because he can't, they're, they're on the verge of homeless. They had several eviction notices. 
the first contract they got was to repair a church. Says, that must be haram. But alhamdulillah, he consulted. What's the ruling of repairing a church? Hmm? Are you allowed to assist people in committing sin? Are you? No, you're not allowed to assist people in committing sin. Is there any sin more grave than disbelief? No. But by rep right, and this is differed upon. Certainly in the Hanafi school, repairing a church is not haram because what you're doing, because the sin does not take place. The sin is not related to the building itself. It's action that happens in the building. So it's not haram. right? And it's a subtle issue. You can read about the issue of assistance and sin. right? But caution isn't just to avoid. Oh, I don't know. That seems haram, so you leave it. Because it could have detrimental consequences in your life. right? So I consulted a number of the senior ulama on his behalf because I knew he wouldn't listen to me. And they said, in his situation, it may be obligatory for him to take that work. It's obligatory for him to provide for his, for his family. And number two, because it's not haram. When you have a choice, it's makru. It is disliked to repair a church, for example, for a Muslim. But it's not haram. Right? So that's where what you have to do is the caution related to when you don't know the ruling is not to just avoid. You avoid till you find out. Then, once you find out, it may entail that, yes, that do I have to avoid it or should I avoid it? Right? Then there's a type of caution that's higher, which is if you, you found out, and this is a matter where there's difference of opinion. The basic expectation for the believer is if there's difference of opinion, if it's allowed in the madhab you follow, stick to your madhab. And you can go ahead with it. Right? So what's something? So for example, there's certain type of fermented foods that in the Hanafi school are permissible. Or for example, the use of mouthwash that has alcohol in it. The Hanafi school is allowed. So when something is differed upon, but it's a, if you're Hanafi, for example, it's allowed in your school, you can act upon it. But it is good to avoid the difference of opinion of another school. Right? Some other schools are very strict. All types of alcohol are najis and haram to use, even without consuming. Are you expected to follow that? No. But if you do, it is good. But without overwhelming yourself. If you feel at all overwhelmed, just stick to your own school. Right? If it's allowed in your school, you can stick to it. But avoiding difference of opinion is generally recommended. If you can, without feeling overwhelmed. Right? Now, in some situations, the other issue happens, right? It's differed upon, but your school doesn't allow it. Right? It's differed upon. Some schools allow, but your school doesn't. For example, if you're a Hanafi, can you eat um, squid and lobster, for example? Can you? No, you can't. In the Hanafi school, it's not allowed. Now, basic, you know, basic taqwa, basic caution is you stick to your school. So what would you do? You know, you, you go buy red lobster, you don't have the red lobster special. Because not allowed. But can you take a dispensation? Yes. And there are different opinions. Some ulama say, no, you have to stick to one madhab. But the predominant opinion is Islamic scholarship. You can read on you are, you are allowed to take a dispensation without making it a habit. If you know for sure, this is allowed in some schools. right? 
And sometimes caution in things like that could be to take a dispensation. Your friend invited you to a special, they booked this exclusive seafood bash, and it is octopus, lobster, crab, squid, other squiggly things that Hanafis didn't consider fish. They say, sorry, I'm Hanafi, I'm not going to eat it. In some cases, caution may be to take a dispensation. Particularly when it's not just because I feel like eating calamari. And of course, there's a there's a rumor. I have mis I made a mistake about it as well. There's a um, there's a rumor <laughs> that cal most calamari being sold was actually the 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 um, was from the the rear tube of a hog. That they used to take that the rectum of a hog that they would be it was a, it would be processed rectum of a of a hog. It was actually a podcast that were they told a story of fake news. And then part two, they refuted it. But most people didn't listen to the whole podcast episode, including me. And they started talking. They became viral. Um, so be careful. But either case, in something that is differed upon, right? but your school doesn't allow, it's you, know, you just stick to your school, but it is allowed to take another school's opinion. That's number one. Number two, in some scenarios, the caution may be to take the dispensation. Like in food matters or, for example, in a situation where and it's, an, it's not just a hearsay dispensation, it's a real dispensation. You need the work and this is allowed according to one of the four schools of Sunni Islam. It would be allowed. Right? It would be allowed. But the caution is, when taking dispensation like that, to consult a learned, God-fearing scholar. Right? So I have a friend, for example, who got work in a particular prison system as a prison guard, high security prison. And the rules there were that th those guards can't keep beards. So I talked to one of the senior scholars, very strict. I didn't even ask him a ruling. So he said, tell him to take the Shafi opinion that the beard is not obligatory. It's Sunnah. Which is the relied upon Shafi opinion. Now the Shafi scholars don't just give that ruling like that. We say, you know, Muslim men keep beards, etc., 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 etc. Right? Of course, my friend didn't act on it. He contested the prison system. Not only did he keep his beard, he worked as a prison guard while wearing his kufi. Partly because he's a bit anti-establishment, he's going to want to make a point. I said, just make a point for Allah. Don't just do it to be a to be a gangster. So, so caution may sometimes entail taking a dispensation at the right time. If you're traveling in a group and they're going to combine prayers properly on the basis of knowledge, sometimes caution may be for the sake of the group, for the sake of this, then you combine prayers with them. Even if you're Hanafi. What do you do there? You consult the learned. Right? Even of another method. That okay, if everyone's combining, what do you advise that I do? Right? So even if something is differed upon with your own school, sometimes caution would be to take the dispensation. And what do you do? You Firstly, you make sure that is this the actual position of that school? It's not just hearsay. Number two, when you can, you consult. If you can't, you consider carefully. Which choice is more likely to be pleasing to Allah? All things considered. And when you don't have the luxury of consulting, like in the case, you know, the, the lobster thing, it's, it's served right now. You have, you know, three scholars on speed dial, nobody answered. So you use your judgment. You know these things are allowed in the Shafi school, for example. And the person who's taking is a religious person. It may entail taking a dispensation. Right? Similarly, in higher levels of caution, there's things that are disli disliked 
right? Some th things are disliked and they're agreed upon. Caution, those are the most important things to avoid of the things that are disliked, right? Like eating with the left hand, for example, right? Across the board, it's disliked. It's not haram to eat with the left hand. It's agreed upon to be disliked. There's some things that are disliked and differed upon that come next, right? All of that is from, like, all of that is from gradual caution. Not everything is, well, just avoid it, right? All of this requires knowledge, step by step. And then a higher caution is to avoid the things that distract you or busy you away from being conscious with Allah, right? And there's a point that we've emphasized that there are priorities in caution. The most important caution is related to the obligatory. And this caution is, the, is obligatory, as we mentioned. Two, a priority in caution is the rights of others, whether these are the material rights of others or the non-material rights. And then you don't backbite, slander, gossip, lie, cheat, deceive, etc., right? Balance caution with respect to food and drink is very important. Right? Allah is pure and accepts only the pure. But you have caution with them by seeking the, the wholesome, right? You can't, you know, seek out industrialized food and shady halal joints that are selling food at impossibly low prices. If you check how much halal chicken wings are, like by the, by the kilo, the kilo of halal chicken wings from that place is cheaper than how much you can get raw chicken wings from. That doesn't really add up, right? So, you know, balanced caution. But then there's also caution with respect to our conduct, right? In fulfilling the rights of others, right? Um, amongst the caution with respect to conduct is that we have to be careful about, for example, gender interaction. There's principles. And that, and that also requires caution. Caution with respect to the company that you keep is very important, right? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, A person's on the religious ways of those whose company they keep. So let each of you look carefully as to whose company they keep. That also requires caution, right? You're really, you know, there's a Syrian scholar who's in town. He's, he's just moved to Canada. He said, you know, it appears to me that some people from the Indian subcontinent, you know, they'll do everything haram and not pray except that they'll eat halal meat. I said, that's a sound observation. He'd not interacted with Indians and Pakistanis much before, right? So, so the, the balance is needed. Yes, halal related to food is important, but the conduct company. You want all other caution to happen in your life, actively seek good company. Right? And be careful about the company you keep by its consequences. Right? What do you end up doing with those people? What do you talk about? And look at the state of your heart. How is your heart at the end of that company, the company you've kept? Does it increase you in presence of heart with Allah, of wanting to seek the pleasure of Allah? Or it was spent in just worldly prattle and to no fruitful outcomes. So next class, inshallah, we're going to close our look at the book of Halal and Haram, bi ta'ala, before we move on to the book of commanding the good and forbidding the wrong. Um, before we close, any questions, bi If you have any questions online, you can take those as well, bi What are the halal and haram rights of spouses with respect to each other? That's a very wide topic, but the ch challenge in marriage is most of the rights are non-material rights. Like, can you legislate what it means to, to have love and mercy for your spouse? Right? That Zubayda Saturday says, don't talk to me, Zubayda. So why? I had enough love and mercy for, on, for you all week. So this weekend is off. I can call you the loser that you are. No, right? There's no enough when it comes to you know, 
the non-material rights of somebody, right? So that's part of the test. But if someone's getting married, or if they are married, they need to know what, what, what are the material rights owed by the husband, by the wife, and what are the non-material rights and responsibilities. And we have a number of courses related to that on Seeker's Guidance. All our courses, alhamdulillah, are completely free. Um, if a marriage is on the verge of a divorce due to the in-laws, does the wife have to have the right to exercise her wish to live separately with no interference from the in-laws, even if the husband doesn't agree? It's the right of the woman that she have what is called a bait shari, a what's legally considered to be separate housing. Right? It's legally considered to be separate housing because it could be part of a larger home, but she has her own room, her own living space, and minimally independent access to the, to the kitchen. Right? It's her own living areas, even if it's part of a house. And the privacy of her room, her living space, if they're poor, even if it's some time that is allocated to her and she can she can do whatever she wants there and nobody else comes in and and to have access to the kitchen it depends on their wealth if they're wealthier she has a right to her own kitchen right so like if they're living for example in the in a walk-in bas basement and they can have like a kitchenette that's her right and it's it's recommended for her to maintain good relations with her in-laws it's haram for her to be bad to her in-laws, but it's recommended to be good. Do no harm. That's the basic responsibility. Do no harm. Be respectful. Beyond the everything else is above and beyond. Right? Now the wife is deferential to her husband, but she doesn't have to defer on her rights. Right? She seeks, seeks her rights in a good way, but that's where we have imbalances. That no, the wife has to do whatever the husband says. No, she has rights. Those are sacred. But at the same time, does the husband have to buy everything the wife wants? No. Right? He, there's a certain amount that he has to provide, not beyond. Right? I had to mediate when, right when I got to Damascus. One of the first phone calls I received once we got a phone in Damascus was I got a call from some close relatives, young, younger than me, and the, the wife read in Reliance of the Traveler that the wife has a right to a full set of clothes for each season. So she said, my husband has to buy me a full set of clothes for each season. The husband says, look, I'm still, I'm still in college and I'm still, you know, I just have, you know, like, you know, a minimum wage job. I can't afford a full set of clothing each winter. Of course, she, she doesn't. All she has, he has to fill in what she doesn't have. So if the jacket is worn out, he has to get her a new jacket. Right? You don't have to get a complete set of new clothes for every season. If you define the seasons as four, that gets pretty expensive if you don't have the money. So in those cases, how you pursue it, you also have to be careful that in some cases, if you seek all your rights, they could also, you know, like it's, it's like at work. Right? There's a difference between being a situation of, of wrongdoing also, there's a pragmatism, right? That at, at work, if they keep expecting some off overtime hours, etc. Yes, it's your right not to do overtime. But if they're going to fire you, you also have to be pragmatic, right? Right? And that's a delicate balance in any area in life, right? That, okay, I only want to eat food that the people who remember Allah prepared. And you're traveling in a non-Muslim country. You're going to find any bread or anything that the food of the people, the remembrance of Allah? No. So you have to be pragmatic. What's the best available? So sometimes in life, one has to come to decisions that are not the ideal decision. But what is a reasonable bad solution? Right? What's a reasonable bad solution? And in those cases, you're not alone. Consult in the specifics. Consult in the specifics. Um, but yeah, but it's important to know your rights so that, right, so that you know 
how to navigate. But that's one of the common things. Right? It's better, Imam al-Ghazali recommends, don't live too close to the in-laws. But lo live close enough so you can visit, you know, regularly. Right? Um, if you live with in-laws in some situations, it's good. But both parties have to set limits. And the, the, the wife shouldn't go to her mother-in-laws and check, okay, what does, what, what, how many sets of clothes does she have? That's haram. So there's their limits, right? But there's limits on the other side. Like, I don't know what's up with mother-in-laws, but I've had several cases of mother-in-laws checking, uh, you know, her daughter-in-laws, like, undergarments. That these aren't, not, these aren't good enough for my husband, for, for my son. That's none of your business, right? right? That's invading someone's privacy. And who has the responsibility to take care of those things? Basically, a principle that the ulama mentioned is each child is responsible for their parents, right? So if you, you know, if the husband's parents are being overbearing on the, on the wife, who can handle that? The wife can't handle that. The husband has to take care with respect, with, with, these, with dignity, as to safeguards. He has to set the limits with his parents. She has to set the limits with her parents. They're speaking down on him, etc. She has a responsibility to safeguard her husband's honor, her, his good name, etc., that he not be insulted, even if she insults him anyways. But she still has to defend his honor, and so on. Right? There's a question. Sometimes I leave five minutes early from work or take breaks to get um, to class or lunch. Right? Um, now, anything that's customarily accepted is acceptable. Right? In our times, in most work, are you allowed to check the internet? Are you allowed to check internet at work? Do they stop you from responding to a text message? No. What's reasonably allowed is allowed. Right? But don't overdo it. Don't overdo it. Right? Don't overdo it. And practical caution, just, just make it clear. Like, you know, sometimes it's so obvious, it's painful to ask somebody. Um, is it okay if I come back from lunch five minutes late? In some workplaces, it's like, it's like a factory situation. You got to clock in, clock out. Like, exactly. Many other jobs, they really don't care. Just get the work done. We don't care. So there you have to assess. You know, practical cause, just ask your manager. Right? But, and then what is for sure allowed is allowed. Right? But it's where there's any degree of unclarity, just ask for clarification. Right? Sometimes people develop bad habits. Right? That, oh, you can use, now people don't print many things, but printing, you know, using the photocopier, etc. We have had situations, someone's offered, you know, we, we'll print the, you know, the brochures. I'll print the brochures at my work. No. That's not reasonable. Like, you could ask anybody. Would you feel shy asking about it? Yeah, then don't do it. Right? So, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitate. Um, there's a question that... That example you gave about tea and taking caution about where it comes from um, and how often and now go in depth, would that be taken even with things with respect to food and stuff? That's yes, all of that when we talked about that earlier is from praiseworthy caution to be careful about if you buy f clothes, right? The halal and haram relates, okay, I'm wearing something permissible. It's recommended, however, to seek clothing to seek anything, food, clothing, dress, drink, anything, that there's no dhulm, there's no wrongdoing associated with it. Most zabiha meat you eat is has a degree of dislikedness in it. And it has spiritual harm in it. Why? Because most factory raised, factory slaughtered animals are ill-treated, either in their lifetime or the way they're slaughtered. And it's not permissible to wrong animals. Now, the part people wronging the animals, they're sinful, but you're indirectly party to that. 
So at the very least, you disliked it with your heart. If you choose to get ethically sourced meat, organic meat, and alhamdulillah, in the greater Toronto area, for example, we have them. There's several suppliers amongst them. For example, Blossom Pure. Right? Get unhesitantly say these, they're careful to, to source. You know, you know, they, they get ethical and organic. You're rewarded for that. You're rewarded for that. To the extent you can. It's better to get, you get your clothes from sources that they, these, especially if you buy regularly, that as best you can, there's some things you realize I can't pay $30 for an undershirt. But what you can strive to get things and all these things, and you'd be shocked how much zulm, wrongdoing, injustice, human injustice, environmental harm, etc., is in most mass-produced items. Right? So to the extent you can, do with less but better. At most disposable fashion, harms the environment, ha harms human beings, has all kinds of injustice associated with it. Get less but better. Other things, like if you consider where your chocolate comes from, most of it, right, most of it is sourced in ways that are not permissible. Right? In terms of labor practices and so be a conscious consumer. Right? Be a conscious consumer. Right? Support local businesses that are wholesome. These are good values. Right? And you're rewarded for that. So we'll stop there, Bidnilay Ta'ala. Um, but it that's recommended caution, right? That's recommended. It's not obligatory. Is it allowed for you just to go? your local department store and buy a 12 pack of undershirts for like next to nothing yeah by the very least you dislike it i'd like to do better than this right you, i'd like to do better than this but, you know but is, is it haram no cotton cotton undershirts permissible but especially when you can but at the very least you should always want what is better And one of the basic keys to it is to, to ac accumulate less, but more meaningfully. Right? A lot of people, for example, I spend less on coffee than most people. I get good quality coffee. I try to get it that is or organic, free trade, etc. But I spend less than people just go to, you know, the local Tim's and have two, two coffees a day. Get better quality, but inshallah, as best we can, it's ethically sourced. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitate wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa akhir da'wana anil